Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to all of you. Thank you. We thank you for being here. We meet together on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 17, in order to do several things. One of them, of course, is to partake of the Lord's Supper. Sometimes I think we are not careful enough to realize how important partaking of the Lord's Supper is to our spiritual life. Jesus is our Savior. He gave his body or his life on a cross and he gave his blood to cover our sins. When we memorialize that, remember that, think about that, these things affect our minds, our hearts, our focus. We're here to focus this morning on God, his son, and the spirit that gives us life, the living water. Our focus in the flesh is not always easy. I know mothers have children that need attention. Lunch is important. <laughs> Things of life have overwhelmed, overwhelmed us at times during the week. But that's what this is for. This is for us as the body of Christ to gather together to know the more important things in this world. Jesus, our Savior and our King. We're going to be led in a prayer, if you'll stand please, by Tim. Let's go to God in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we are just so grateful to be here this day and to be in this assembly with brothers and sisters in Christ that we can get in touch with that spiritual side of who we are that uh, someday is just going to live forever. We pray we do the things that are pleasing to you and the things that we study in our classes. We pray that we would put them in our heart. And we, um, as we assemble here this day, we are here to honor you. We pray that we do that in our songs. We pray that as we assemble around this table, we will remember your son that did so much for us. We're grateful for all you give us. We know we live in a land that has much. We pray that that will lead us to you and not away from you. Um, just thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Welcome. It's good to see everyone out this morning. I asked Rick what he was going to preach on. He said healing. And I said, well, there's not a whole lot of songs on healing, but there's a lot of songs about refuge and support. And I did find one in the supplement, so we'll sing number 70 here in a few minutes. That talks about healing. So that'll be our theme this morning. And thank you, uh, Tim, for that prayer. We're going to start off with number nine, A Wonderful Savior. We're going to sing all four verses of that song. Hymn number nine in the green hymn book. Do, do, me, so. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He Thirsty. 
Second song is number 557, Rock of Ages. This is an old one. We'll sing all three verses of this song, Rock of Ages. <clears throat> Do, do, so, rock of ages, clap for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy rift inside with flow be of sin. Sing number 447, Near to the Heart of God, is a song of preparation to get our hearts and our minds in the proper perspective as we remember these emblems that Jesus instituted for us to remember Him. We'll sing all three verses of this song, 447. Do, do, me.
Amen. <coughs> I appreciate Rick's comments this morning and the opening comments that he made this morning regarding the Lord's Supper. We've come to the point in the time in our service where we will remember what Jesus did for us. There's a lot of talk in the religious world about being in Christ. In John chapter 6, towards the end of the chapter, Jesus says that one of the things that puts him in us and us in him is partaking of these emblems. In the 54th uh, verse of that 6th chapter, he says that whoever does this will live forever. That's how important what we are about to do is. Let us think about these things as we go to God and thank him for the unleavened bread. Father, thank you for another opportunity that we have as a Christian family to assemble together and to surround this table. Thank you, Father, for the freedom that we have that we can do this without being made afraid in any way. Thank you, Father, for this bread that you've given us to remember your son as he hung there upon that cross. We're so grateful, Father, for the sacrifice of your son, for his love for us. And we pray, Father, that you would help us, not, not just while we surround this table, but while we sit in this building and worship you this day that we can push out the cares and the worries of our individual lives and give ourselves wholly over to the memory of your son, Jesus. Again, Father, we thank you for this emblem, and we pray that as we partake of it, that we would do so in a manner that's pleasing unto you. This is our prayer in the name of your son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Let's continue in prayer. Fathers, we bow before your loving kindness and as we offer up this prayer of thanks for this fruit of the vine, this emblem. Yes, we're thankful for the thoughts and comments that Rick approached us and welcome, especially the part where he says this is good for our, our hearts and minds and that if we truly do examine ourselves, this, this will all live out as we partake of this as individuals here that we're not doing this just to be doing this. Uh, we're doing this to honor the words of Jesus and re reflect upon that sacrifice and, and this emblem here which is symbolic of a new covenant of remissions of sins. That in these modern times we can partake of this and walk in paths of righteousness and, and, and just 
simply do what the early Christians did in observing this death, burial, and resurrection. So we're, we're happy to do this, and as we reflect upon this with, in our hearts and our minds, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's never been a greater blessing given than the one that we just remembered. But the blessings don't stop there. Every day, he gives us blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Everybody here woke up in a warm and dry house this morning. Everybody had something to eat. I feel pretty comfortable saying nobody wondered how they were going to get here this morning. Those things don't happen on accident. It's not by chance you have those things in your life. God bless you with those things. And we have an opportunity now to just take a short amount of time to think about those blessings and to give back a portion of that which he's given us that the work in this community might continue. Let us think about those things as we give thanks for our blessings. Father, when we sit and think about the many things that you give us, Father, there's not enough time. There's... We can't comprehend the things that you do for us every day, Father. But regardless, we do our best to be thankful for the things that we do understand and we do realize. We thank you for those things, Father. And we pray that as we give back just a small portion of that which you bless us with, we pray that we do it with a free and a willing heart, Father, not grudgingly in any way. And we pray, Father, that the giving doesn't stop here that we would do what you ask us to every day of our lives, Father, when we see those in need. 
And we just thank you, Father, again for all the many things you do for us. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Using your hymn books this morning, if you're Mark 745, this will be the uh, invitation song after uh, Brother Rick's lesson this morning. Uh, we're going to sing uh, number 70 out of the supplement, and it's entitled Healing in His Wings. And then upon uh, finishing that, uh, JC will read us the scripture. I'm going to ask that you stand for the singing of the song and remain standing for the scripture reading from JC. Number 70 in the supplement, Healing in His Wings. <clears throat> oh, do me. Oh. 
This morning's scripture reading comes from John chapter 3, verse 12. It says, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe me, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Please be seated. Brother Rick. There it is. Good morning. Good morning. So, evangelism. We're still doing that. This morning, it may be a little bit different in the sense that, as Brian announced, we're going to talk about healing. Now, what in the world does evangelism and healing have to do with one another? Somebody just mouthed everything. They're right. It has everything to do with it. Healing. We think of healing, of course, is going to the doctor, um, seeing that we need or have a need that can only be fixed by a professional. And so we want to go find out what's wrong. We hope the man's smart enough to know what to do. We complain when he's not, and we leave. That's called healing. Now, why? Why does he not always know what to do? Why can't he just lay his hand on me and fix it? Well, obviously, as we know, he doesn't have that power, does he? Is healing controversial religiously? It can be. In some places it is. We have beliefs that people don't have the same as we do when it comes to healing in the flesh. The importance that I want us to try to see today is that healing, healing in the flesh is one thing. Healing in the spirit is the more important thing. Which one of these can Jesus do? Yep, you just said it, both. Jesus emptied himself and he came in the flesh and he was a man, a baby for a long time. Then he became a child. Then he became a man. That's just the normal course that happens, and he took it. When he started his ministry, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he was filled with powers that he didn't have as a normal man. One of those powers was the power of healing. One of those powers was to be able to heal. Jesus begins to heal in the flesh to show his compassion in the Spirit, is the statement I put up there. And this is what I want us to understand. The most important healing that Jesus did was not in the flesh. In fact, if you look up all the healings specifically that Jesus did with names or specific people, there were about 24 or 25. Now, there were many places where it said they brought all of their sick and, their, and those that needed to be healed, and Jesus healed them. We don't know how many of those were. He could have healed thousands of people in his lifetime. John made it clear. These things, not everything that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples are written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. So it was for belief and faith that Jesus healed in the flesh. Why is the healing in the spirit the more important one? Because this is what Jesus came for. If he had come to heal all of the ailments of the flesh, he would have never left. Because we still have them. He didn't come for that, did he? He came to heal us in spirit so that we might have eternal life with our Father again, God Almighty. So in John chapter 4, the ultimate master evangelist, Jesus the Christ, begins to let them understand the more important things as J.C. wrote, 
as he told Nicodemus, if I tell you things in the flesh and you don't understand them, how are you ever going to figure out the things of the Spirit? That's a little paraphrase, but nevertheless, you get the point. Yeah, they were not, and we are not. We can argue about healing in the flesh all day long. And no, I don't believe anybody is able to do it today. But God is. The Holy Spirit is. Christ is. Should we pray for healing? Absolutely. Why? Because they can do it. They can still do it. But men can't. The point is not of the flesh that's important. The point is of spirit. Now, how does evangelism play into that? Can you heal? Come on. Can you heal? How can you heal? In spirit. You can heal. And that's what evangelism is about. Evangelism is about getting people to understand their need, their sickness, their oppression, and come to the Lord for healing, which we can help them with. So you can help heal people, not in the flesh, but more importantly, a greater healing of in the Spirit. These are the things that we should be about. These are the things that God wants us to understand and know. In John 4, 43, as Jesus continued his evangelism, after two days he went forth from there out of Samaria when we talked about the woman at the well, and he went into Galilee, which he now is going to make his primary home base. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Luke chapter 4, he talks about that when he went down to Nazareth. He's primarily here talking about Jerusalem, I believe, though, not Nazareth. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him having seen all the things that he did, why did they receive him? All the things that he did. Can we receive him? And how should we do it? By knowing all the things that he did. You see, it's our responsibility to understand why healing in spirit is even available. It's our responsibility to be able to tell ourselves, at least, that Jesus has healed us in spirit. It's our responsibility. We have to know if we're going to receive him. Having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. Of course, this was the first Passover that he had went through, and he was, had gone back to Galilee now. For they themselves also went to the feast. So those way up in Galilee, were they... Jews that were honest and wanted to follow after God and went to the feast down in Jerusalem in order to do so? Yes. And that's where, you, where he will spend most of his time as he continues his ministry. All right. So when Jesus chooses his followers that he's going to use, his disciples, his apostles, he teaches a vital lesson to them. We see that in Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. Levi was a tax collector. Many were amazed that Jesus would pick a tax collector. The Jews didn't like them. He had a big house, most likely, because most of the tax collectors were fairly well, fairly well off. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining the table with him. Oh, my, more of those guys. Oh, well. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, Jesus' disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician. You want to be healed? You go to a doctor. Why? You need a physician. Something is wrong. You know something is wrong. And if you're like me, you wait till the last minute until you know it's really wrong. That's what we do. But we eventually figure it out, don't we? What has God given us in the flesh of our bodies that helps us recognize we need a physician? Pain. That's right. Do we like it? No. Is it good for us? Yes. It gets me to the doctor eventually. It gets me where I need to go. It gets me to the point where I have to admit I have a problem. So, 
What does evangelism and spiritual physician have to do with any of this? It's pretty simple, isn't it? You're thinking of it in your heart right now, aren't you? If you're starting to recognize, if you will at least recognize, if you will not put it off too long so it overcomes and destroys you, if you will get to the physician, the great physician, Jesus the Christ, can he heal you in spirit before his almighty Father? Absolutely he can. So what's wrong with so many not going to the Dr. Jesus? Why don't they go? What's the problem? They don't recognize their need. So is showing somebody their need a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It has to be. It has to be. Because they're never going to recognize it without your help, most likely. Many people come to the realization that they don't have what they need in their lives. I realize that. Most of us have. That's why we're here with Jesus. That's why he's the great physician to us. But a lot of people don't have enough knowledge of understanding to be willing to acknowledge that and to look for help. Can we be a help to them if they don't know what to do? How many times has somebody come to you and described an ache and a pain and you remember something in your past life and you say, oh, I remember when so-and-so had that and they went and they did this and they took that. and they, We do that all the time. That's just us wanting to help. Do we do that all the time in spirit? Or do we shy away from it? I'm not a doctor. I don't want to play one on TV, and I'm certainly not the great physician. But can we give a word of advice spiritually so that people will recognize their need? We can. We should. We need to have that understanding. It's not the one as well that needs a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why did Jesus eat with sinners? This is the reason he came. Does he still want to save sinners? Yes. Are we of them? Yes. Has he saved us? Yes. Can we save others? Yes. Am I willing to tell others they need a physician? I'm waiting for you to say yes. Yes. <laughs> The points I'm trying to make this morning really are not that difficult. We understand them. We know them. Jesus chose his followers. That didn't change, did it? We're going to have a conversation now with a man who needs a physician. And Jesus is going to heal him. These are throughout the Gospels. Like I said, there's 24, 25 of them. We can read them over and over and over and have a great uplifting of faith by doing so. And we should, because each one of them has a different lesson in them. What I want us to think about this morning when we read this, this conversation is the understanding that Jesus Christ can heal anything, whether it was in flesh or spirit. Now, we depend on him for spirit. We pray to him for flesh, and it's up to him, according to his will. But now, we have available to us the great physician through the scriptures that can heal everything that's more important than anything in the flesh. John 4, 46, therefore, why? Because he's going to begin healing people. This will be his second miraculous sign, the first being the water into wine at Canaan. That wasn't a healing, but it was a sign of miraculous works and abilities that Jesus had now began to do. He came again to Canaan, same place he did the water into wine, same place he did his first miracle, same place the people were oohed and awed at the wedding feast. 
He says, came to Canaan of Galilee where he had made the water into wine. That's first sign. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. That's a ways away. He had to travel to come and see Jesus. He had heard about him, obviously. Did he believe in him? Yes. Did he have a need that he recognized? Absolutely, in his son. Was he willing to do anything, anything to help his son? Yes, he was, wasn't he? When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him. He was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. A son you love. You love probably more than your own life. He's at the point of death. Recognition that there's nothing anyone else can do for him. He knows Jesus has powers. He knows Jesus is someone special. And he knows the need is overwhelming and critical. Can we see the world that way? Can we see our family that way? Can we see those around us that way? What if everyone looked at everyone else who was not a follower of Jesus Christ and been baptized into his death? What if everyone looked at everyone else that did not have their need fixed yet? and saw imminent death for them without help. Can you be that hero? But I'm not a hero. You can be. Saving a soul from death is a hero. Now, it isn't through your power he's saved. We always make that clear. Jesus the Christ has the power of salvation in his name only. Will anyone be saved? But we can be a part of it. We can start the conversation. We can point it in the right direction. We can see the need. We can do something to be a helper. I realize that God doesn't need me. He could strike me dead tomorrow and everything would be just fine. Thank you. But he does want me to help him. He does want me. And he wants me to help him. And if we can see the critical need of the world around us, then maybe we can act like this royal official. He went to him, he implored him to come down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. There's a need. He has a hope. He has an expectation in Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. That's not the best way to start a conversation with a Jesus, is it? Probably not. The man probably thought to himself, oh my, he's not going to give me the time of day. But what was Jesus trying to get all of us to understand? He's God. He created us. He created the world we live in. He gives us the food we eat. He gives us the cars we came here in. He gives us the home we live in. He gives us everything, and sometimes we don't give him the time of day. Do we? Who should be insulted here? The royal official or Jesus the Christ? Jesus is going to heal this man's son as he could heal any man's son, but more importantly in spirit. The royal official said to him, Sir. Now, keep in mind the royal official is probably somebody fairly high, most likely in the Roman government, not, although not absolute, but nevertheless, people usually call him Sir. Now, he's addressing Jesus who, according to the Jews, was a nobody from Nazareth. Nothing good comes from Nazareth, you know. And he calls him sir. Why? Need. Need. Physician. Physician. He knew Jesus had something 
that he could do for him. And he desired it overwhelmingly for his son. Jesus answers him or says to him, go, your son lives. Now, that's one of the shortest conversations anybody's ever had with Jesus. There's two lines there, and yet a life is saved. The man got what he needed. He is overwhelmed with what Jesus has done for him once he gets down the road a little ways, and here's the confirmation of it. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is that too much to say about Jesus? In your name only, we have salvation. Is that too much to say about Jesus? If you'll come to Jesus, he will save you from your sins. Is that too much to say about Jesus? The conversations don't have to be long. They do have to be piercing. Sometimes the piercing doesn't your responsibility, or isn't your responsibility. It has to happen in the heart of the one you're talking to. This man believed Jesus. He didn't argue with him. He didn't say to him, well, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to do something? Shouldn't we pray? Shouldn't we look to heaven and ask something? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we, shouldn't we? He didn't do any of that, did he? He simply said... Nothing. Go, your son lives. The man believed. By faith, this man knew his son would live because Jesus said so. The word that Jesus spoke to him, he believed. So he started off back to Capernaum. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying to his son, saying that his son was living. How? How could that be? Jesus, four words. Jesus said, go, your son lives. That's it. Jesus said, go, your son lives. That's it. That's all there was to it. Can we get this? Can we know this? Can we understand this? Can we tell the world about this? I'm not a naive person very often. So I totally understand there's a whole lot more than this to it. I know that you're going to have many more words to say like the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 in order to convince people. But I also know if you don't start, you're never going to get anywhere. Never going to get anywhere. So even if you just start saying to people, do you know that Jesus saves you from your sins if you're willing to come to him? Even if that's all you put in your vocabulary, it's a start and see what the reaction is. Sometimes they may come back to you and say, yes, I know. And this is where I go, and this is what I do, and then you have a conversation. Absolutely, a conversation. Sometimes it may be that they will say to you, I don't care, go away, leave me alone. And you may have to, after many more words, shake the dust off your feet. Because they don't want to know. They would like to not be healed in spirit. That's what they're telling you. That's what we have to understand. So he inquired of them the hour, the very hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Now think about that. Yesterday, yesterday. How far did he come? He came a ways. How far was he going back? He was going back a ways. What did he find out? The very hour that Jesus said, your son lives, he was getting better. The very hour that you call on the name of the Lord through the baptism of Jesus Christ, as he has told you that he will do, you will begin to live in spirit again. 
because that washes away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This is exactly what God wants us to understand. This is what the great physician can do. But we have to recognize a need, we have to start a conversation, and we have to be willing to continue, no matter how hard it might get in the conversation. They said yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed, and his whole household. Did he keep his mouth shut? Did he not say anything to anyone else? Did he not tell his servants, his wife, his sons, his daughters? Did he not share what he knew was what he believed? Was his son was saved by Jesus Christ? Of course not. He overwhelmingly shared it because he wanted everyone to know what great things had happened for him through that great physician, Jesus the Christ. These things we should want to know as well. In Matthew 4.23, Jesus and Satan are at war. They're at war. We need to understand that we're in the middle of that war. We're in the middle of that war and we're taking fire from both sides to some degree. Jesus can save us in the war. He can be the place where we have safety. He can give us opportunity to live on. Jesus was going throughout all Judea, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Why was he healing in the flesh? Because he wanted them to understand the more important was coming. It will be due Jesus Christ who will die on the cross for your sins, rise on the third day, sit on a throne, and he will be king. Casting Satan down like lightning. Keeping him from the power of death until a time. You see, Paul said we are an aroma of life to life. No longer an aroma of death to death. That's right. When this life ends, we go to life eternal with God in heaven, Jesus Christ our Lord. The news about him, it spread throughout Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering from various diseases and pains, and demonics and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. How many did he not get done? How many could he not go far enough? How many did he say, your faith was not good enough, I'm sorry, you can't be healed? How many? Not a one. Not a single one, because the power of Jesus Christ is absolute. Amen. The power to heal us in spirit is absolute Amen. in Jesus Christ. If you had the power to heal in the flesh, would you do it? Would you hide that power? Would you only use it on your family? Or would you have enough compassion and mercy in your heart to even go out into the world and heal? You have a better power. You have a greater power. You have a more important power through Jesus Christ. Sometimes I would like to just grab them by the hair and drag them here. But we can't do that, can we? Evangelism is about changing minds, changing hearts, showing a need, and having them recognize it. And it's frustrating. It can be very frustrating because sometimes you know. You know they're thinking the way you want them to think. You know they're on the edge. You know they're right there. You know you want to shake them and you want to say to them, come on, let's get this done. Something is keeping them from that, but you know. It's okay. Because they're never denying you. They're denying Jesus if they decide not to. It's okay. You do the best you can 
And that's all God is asking from you. It's okay. If you can't do what somebody else can do, don't worry about that. It's okay. It's also okay to ask for help. It's also okay to say to someone, well, I don't really know that much about this conversation, but would you like to talk to somebody who might? That's okay too. I have to do that sometimes. Satan wants us. Satan wants to destroy us. And he will if we'll let him. In Luke 4, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by the spirit, not of this world, of an uncommon demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This demon was afraid of Jesus Christ because he knew the power that Jesus Christ had. We have a demon of sin in each one of us. It's not a spirit that comes upon us in a, without our will. It's a choosing of sin over life, over Christ, over God. Jesus said to this man, this demon, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. Does he have that kind of power? When the demon had thrown him down into the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. Jesus casts out demons, evil spirits, and certainly he can cast out sin. He can cast our sin out of us. And when the demon had thrown down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all. And they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? Do we have the same curiosity as they did? We want to present the gospel in ways that causes curiosity. It makes people ask questions. Then when they ask questions... Please, don't ignore their questions. Take their questions, do the best you can with them, study them and find the answers here, according to the word of Christ, not according to what we think it ought to be. For with authority and power he, Jesus Christ, commands even the things of spirit. The unclean spirits, and they came out. And the report about him was spreading throughout the locality. Peter will explain this a little better when he talks to Cornelius. And he makes it clear. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, who has the sp spiritual healing that he has. And God anointed him, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit and power to cast out demons, to heal in the flesh, yes. But more importantly, he gave him the power to save in spirit. And how he went about doing good and healing. Throughout that time, Cornelius lived in the area. He knew exactly what took place. All who were oppressed by the devil. How are we oppressed by the devil? Yes, the devil does oppress in physical fleshly sicknesses. But, more importantly, we are oppressed by the devil in those things of spirit. That will kill our spirit. Sin. Sin. It's the ugliest, the most evil, and the most widespread sickness in this world. Sin. Who's my doctor for sin? Is there a specialist? Yeah, there is a specialist for that, isn't there? Can I get an appointment? Absolutely. He's available to everybody, isn't he? Do I want him to heal me? Now that's the question, doesn't it? God was with him. He could do all of these things. We need to understand that God is with Jesus Christ now, right now. And he can heal me. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Who is the peace I need to seek? Peace with God. Peace with God through Jesus Christ. Hosea said, I will heal their apostasy, the backsliding, the gone astray, the sin, and I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. 
John tells us grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. From God the Father, from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Where do I learn about truth and love? The Holy Spirit. How much do I love? How much do I want Jesus Christ as my Savior? And how much do I want to help Him spread the truth? Those are the questions we need to ask ourselves when we're talking about evangelism. The healing and spirits available to every single man and woman on the face of the earth. Are we willing to spread the word? If you're here this morning and you have not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you have not canceled out your debt. You have not been forgiven of your sins. You have not done what the scriptures clearly say must be done in order to have the great physician heal you. But you can. It's simple. It's not climbing the biggest mountain. It's not traveling across the sea. It's simply deciding in your heart and mind to be pierced, to know, to understand, and to ask. Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. And save me. Jesus, my Lord. Please come forward now as we stand and sing the song select. Please be seated for some announcements at this time.